talking about earlier, we had sources in early August telling us that, um, uh, telling us that uh, people were were working were working with the uh, with the police doing these things, um, and uh, uh, but we we didn't want to report that and confirm that because um, there was a. Um, there, because we we couldn't personally confirm it, we couldn't actually go out and see it. Yeah, I hear you. You know, and there's so many people out there nowadays with podcasts that call themselves a journalist. They come up and just repeating, or YouTubers, you know, just repeating the same old uh, hokey stuff over and over again. When there's enough really good, interesting stories that are real that you can report on, you know, uh, that they, there's no need to really go out there and always crazy exaggeration and stuff. I'm looking at your your blog here. One of the um, stories on here is a look at the Reno police surveillance equipment. Now. My first question is, why would the – if the opposition up there, if the left is so small, uh, why would they need any surveillance equipment? Well, I think part of it is – the part of the surveillance equipment is just general body cameras, um, general, like, use of body, body-worn cameras, uh, automated license plate readers, stuff right. like that. Um, but there's also the sort of – there's there's a in the last couple of years there's, there's been this push to use, um, in, in my opinion the most the most important part of that article was the Amazon Ring, where it's, it's this Amazon like camera that I, I'm sure you've seen ads for sure. that you can hook up to your your front door and like when someone rings your doorbell it turns on, or like when someone walks up to your front door it turns on so it can videotape them. Um, and what's happened is the the police have now gotten access to these these cameras um so they can use your amazon ring as a surveillance camera um and they have access to it and they can they can look through it um and that what they what that means is nationwide uh the police have a surveillance net almost where if there's a city with a large concentration or even just a neighborhood with a large concentration of these amazon rings rings they basically have security cameras in that neighborhood at every house mm. and so they can look and see like who's been coming to this house who's been like coming through here and so you have a um almost private use so you've got this private company amazon selling security cameras to consumers which the police have access to yeah, that's really incredible, too. Yeah, and another one, too, is the Ancestry.com. People send their DNA in there, and then uh, the police have access to that, too, as well. They sell to the cops. And even Facebook, you know, um, we put all, all our data in there, and then uh, these databases become available. They sell our information. Uh, some of the most uh, – I'm a private investigator, so I know how, much, how valuable this type of information is. And just imagine if you have a, a database of all my enemies, everybody who I've blocked and unfriended, you know, because those are the people you want to talk to when you're investigating people. So another uh, frightening future, you know. Uh, yep. I don't know, man. <laughs> it's kind of a depressing show today, to you? No. What else are you That's working fair. on over there at the Arena Worker? So our, our main focuses are usually um, – activity um and uh militia activity protests and uh cubanon so we we try and focus on like little sects like like little uh chapters of of extremism in the northern nevada area um right now we're we're sort of collecting information on uh cubanon in northern nevada's response to the election results um but we're, we're wanting to wait until uh, probably maybe mid-January, maybe even February, to start putting that article out because we want to put out a complete story. We don't want to say, like, well, Joe Biden won the election. That's how they responded, but we don't know how they'll feel in two months when he's sworn in. We want to wait until we have that full story and put it out all together. Um, and so that's, that's a sort of what we're working on right now, but that's sort of a longer-term story. And when you investigating QAnon, is this all online, or do you meet with local QAnon protests and organizations stuff like that? You see them all over the place, right? Um, it's it's definitely a mix. There's uh, there's 
somewhat regular QAnon rallies that um, that you that we can attend and that we we've attended before. But generally, um, the QAnon groups tend to live mostly online, and yeah. so it's the easiest way to sort of get a read on what's going on is to find local Facebook groups that discuss that um, or local. We'll go on Parlor and follow people on Parlor that are local um, QAnon supporters, and sort of get a read on what they're saying, what they're putting out. Um, and if we can find a local like rally or r- local meeting up point, we'll go and and focus on that. And and have you uh, been following the different theories of of who who Q really is? A lot of people think it's the owner of 4chan. I think he calls himself Coder Monkey on Twitter. Code monkey. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I I, uh, I think uh, Jim Watkins is the the owner of Acoon is kind of the the prevailing theory. Um, Jim or his son Ron right. Watkins. Um, the, that seems to be sort of the prevailing theory, and I think there's a lot of a lot of credit to that. But I think also, um, I think the most the most plausible uh, theory seems to be that. It started off as you know one or two people essentially as a joke because the the idea behind QAnon that there's like a government insider who's like leaking information out isn't it's not a unique one this is sort of something that's been happening on internet forums for a long time now and so there's this sort of idea uh, that it started off basically as that as like someone doing it as kind of a one-off uh, joke kind of thing kind of trying to prank some people and then it really caught steam and ended up being hijacked by the uh, owners of uh, HM, uh, Jim and Ron Watkins, and they're sort of the people behind it now. Um, and that makes sense. I think I think there's a lot of plausi- I think there's a lot of possibility behind that. Um, but I, I I'm one of those people who doesn't want to say this is absolutely who who's behind it unless I know for sure. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and, and it does make sense too because just think he, he can put out the clues because people don't understand Q just writes these weird fortune cookie type clues and then a whole bunch of people come in and decode them so if you know what the clues are if you're making up the clues you can also have some socket uh, puppet accounts to decode them as well <laughs> you know what I mean to go out yep. there and uh, orchestrate the whole thing and have people say oh this is so convincing this is so yep. uh, yeah and and the the big the, the prevailing so the reason a lot of people think it's uh, Jim or Ron Watkins is because there was I want to say sometime in, in late 2018 maybe early 2019 I don't remember exactly um, there was on, on HN there was this, this moment when um, the, the Q account that was putting out the Q posts um, was like hey my account got hacked right. um, can Ron Watkins confirm that this is actually me Ron Watt, and then Rod Watkins' account comes in and is like, "Yes, that's this is actually." Yeah, I think I'll, did I lose you? I think this time it's on your end. Let me see. Yep, I'm I'm working fine. Oh, are you back? Hello. Hey, JJ, what's up? All right, so we have JJ Mazzucatelli. He's back. We've been having a lot of technical and audio problems today. It's been really a uh, uh, more than usual. But, J.J., when we got cut off, you were saying about how uh, uh, Q had claimed that he was hacked and his account was compromised. And he talks all this kind of military lingo code, too, right? And in the beginning, he says, well, I have to talk about – I have to talk in clues and in code because if I don't, the spy bots will catch me and I'll, they'll track me down within minutes. But he's been doing it now for right. – it's on the news now. <laughs> it's no excuse anymore. But you said that, that Watkins came on and confirmed it was the real Q, right? Yeah, that's sort of what what happened was um, Q basically went on one day and was like, "Hey, in in military lingo, yeah. or I guess it, it, it's more like the idea of what someone thinks military lingo sounds like. It it's not really doesn't really resemble, I think, any, the way anyone actually talks, but sort of resembles what you might think military lingo is from watching like a spy movie." Um, and goes on and says, "Hey, my account was hacked. Um, can uh, Ron Watkins?" Um, come on and confirm that this is actually me. And then Ron Watkins comes on and is like, yep, this is Q, we're all good. Um, and what the sort of prevailing theory is, is that Ron Watkins made an account, was like, hey, this is Q, my account got hacked, and Ron Watkins confirmed me, mm. and Ron Watkins came in and confirmed 
uh, himself as Q. And that that seems to that makes the most sense to me. That seems to make the most sense to everyone else who tries to keep up with this. Um, I, I can't say for certain that that's what happened, but that does seem to make the most sense, especially when you look at like the fact that um, the QAnon sort of populace is one of the main drivers for the business of 8chan or 8kun now. Like that website's main uh, group is um, made up of Q followers. And so it makes sense that the people who own that website would want to be able to control Q and control uh, the way in which people are interacting with their website. Yeah, there was a, even a, a blind item on Crazy Days and Crazy Nights by an uh, anti-lawyer uh, where he said uh, that uh, there was an offer on the dark web to sell the password to Q for $1 million. Did you see that? I did. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, that ended up uh, being fake. And oh, really? a lot of, uh, I believe so. There was a... I remember when that came up and a lot of people... It, it was during this sort of... There were, there were a couple of days where directly after the election, um, Q hadn't posted for a while, and a lot of Q followers were starting to freak out. And then this posting came up on, on the dark web that was like, buy, you can buy this very popular account on Acoon for a million dollars. Um, and shortly after that, Q started posting again. And so there was a sort of idea of like, what if the account got bought um, right after the election because the people who were running it uh, didn't see a profit anymore. Um, but I think since then, if it, if you look at the way that Q's been posting, what what they've been saying, that sort of thing, it doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense uh, for it to be a different person. It sounds like the same person. The language is the same. Um, and so it could be – it's entirely possible that it was sold for a million dollars and it got bought, but it would make more sense, I think – for that to essentially have been a fake and for someone to have uh, mm. tried to trick someone into thinking they bought the Q account when in in reality people uh, who have the Q account are still holding on to it because there's a lot of money behind it. There's a lot of money that you can make um, by running the website that hosts Q. There's a lot of money you can make by selling QAnon merchandise. Um, there's a guy in the early days of QAnon who wrote a book about QAnon and crowdfunded it and made six figures crowdfunding in this book about QAnon. Like he was a Q follower and wanted to write like a, a history of Q. Um, and he made six figures writing this, this book. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of money and I, uh, tied up in owning this account and making sure you have this account. And so I don't think that they would sell it for a million. Yeah, early, just early on. Track. Yeah, Jerome Corsi was the Q whisperer. He was the coding Q. <laughs> and he was charged on yeah. live stream. And then Q came out. You know what, bro? We're out of time, man. I really enjoyed this, though. JJ Mazzucatelli. JJ, what do you want to leave us with? Um, I would say uh, the most the most important thing right now is always making sure. I, I think when, when you want to report the facts, when you want to tell people what's going on, make like double, triple checking every time and if it's if it's from personal experience that makes it all the better but always double and triple check whenever you want to report anything um no matter what it is because you never know uh where uh the origin of a story is and it's always good to double and triple check your facts yeah and please check out the reno worker at uh, jj and chris's uh um patreon and, and this story the cops private enforces this is really a big deal okay for the cops to be uh, using uh unsworn uh no unnamed uh you know a militia men to be providing security especially for the president of the united states of america it's a huge huge story so keep an eye on this uh, you're doing some excellent reporting there jj thank you so much thank you so much for having me good night